Okay. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Pop Studies Building. I think this is our first one of the new year. Um, I'm Holly Lovett. I'm a member of the Brown Bag Organizing Committee. And today we're really excited to have um, Catherine Mitchellmore from um, the Ford School here at Michigan. Kathy's an professor of public policy and a leading scholar and educator on the social safety net, education policy, labor economics, and economic demography. And as a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, she's a recognized uh, expert on the efficacy of the earned income tax credit and its impact on children. We're really excited to hear more about her recent research in this area. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here to present some of this work. Um, I have to say I'm a little nervous because this is work that she's in the HRS. But I cannot personally actually using the HRS. I have used it, but it's been many years. So, um, but I am leaning on you know, my colleagues here uh, on the HRS work. So, um, please forgive me if I say something horribly about the HRS, but I don't think I will. But I might not know the answer to some of your questions. Um, so this work is joint um, with uh, some of my former colleagues, Emily Beamers, who's an associate professor at Syracuse, and a PhD student that we're co-advising, Anna uh, Rizzo Strauss. Um, so this project is part of, the paper is part of a, a, a slightly larger project where we're um, interested in how the EHC affects intergenerational transfers. Um, and so at the end of that, we were kind of going into this as trying to put into one big paper um, an analysis of kind of how the EHC affects you know, the transfers that EITC eligible adult children give their parents and, and likewise what the parents um, exchange with the children and it just kind of got unwieldy and so today we decided to kind of split it into two pieces and so today everything I'm going to talk about is flowing down the intergenerational ladder here so we're going to be um, looking at how the EITC crowds out financial assistance from parents um, so we'll, I'll get into this and I'll show you some kind of charts of the different generations but here we're mostly thinking about a set of kind of the middle generation of adult children we're going to call them for EATC eligible, they're the EATC eligible population, and we're interested in whether getting more EITC benefits or larger benefits affects the transfers that their parents give to them. It's essentially what we're going to be uh, looking at here. So we see this kind of fitting into a larger empirical literature, which is kind of huge and hard to, for me to characterize, but I'll just give a couple examples here on how public spending on different public programs in the US crowds out private investments uh, and family assistance. Uh, so here, there's a lot of different examples of, of this. So I think a common area for this is in, say, in public health insurance, how the provision of public health insurance crowds out private investment in health insurance. Um, but in terms of more intergenerational um, transfers, there's certain literature on this in the public pension program, social security um, a program uh, uh, world, so how um, establishing or expanding social security benefits or pension program impacts transfers between adult children and their parents. There is also literature on, on cash welfare, unemployment insurance, et cetera. And there isn't really a consensus, I would say. A lot of these different figures, um, some of them find out, some of them find no effects, some of them find crowd in. So it's really Kind of, uh, it depends, I think, uh, but there's a, a large literature kind of interested in this question of how public spending uh, affects private investments. So we were motivated by this. There's not really very much at all uh, literature on how um, the EITC has intergenerational impacts. Um, my colleague Natasha Pilkowskis and I have done a little bit of work on this looking at kind of transfers uh, down, so looking at um, the impact on, on children, um, but not uh, very much or really nothing has been done on, uh, on the parent uh, adult child to parent generation. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, we found, we found this kind of surprising because the EITC is actually at least on par uh, in terms of spending as um, uh, how we quantify private investments. So, it, depending on the year, uh, the EITC at the federal level, we spend between 60 and $65 billion on this program every year. Um, it reaches about 31 million families, um, which represents about half of all children in the US. Um, and some older estimates on the, uh, on the magnitude of private financial transfers from parents to adult children um, is, is fairly comparable. So estimates from the 80s suggest it's about 32 billion. If you scale that up to 2023 dollars, it's about 87 billion. So they're not too far off in terms of the magnitude uh, of these transfers. I should say I'm very happy for people to interrupt me. So please um, stop me with any questions as we go. Um, and so I know you might be thinking, well, this is, you know, if you know something about the EITC, it's really targeted towards lower income families. And so, you know, we might not 
maybe transfer from parents to children isn't going to be as great for lower income families, but even from, uh, you know, for adult children who come from relatively low income families, financial transfers from parents to adult children could be quite substantial, particularly, you know, within some of the part of the age range that we're going to be focusing on here today, um, averaging over $9,000 between the ages of, of 18 and 34. So even among, you know, fairly low income families, you still get a lot of affordable uh, support for the children. Um, but we also know that downward financial transfers tend to flow from parents who might have higher income to their younger adult children, um, especially lower income uh, adult children, um, and, and in particular around certain life events that children experience, say around going to college, leaving home, having a child, uh, getting married. Uh, so here we're also very interested in, in, for those of you who might be experiencing this uh, yourselves uh, with your adult children, we were very interested in, in people's own uh, experiences in this, in this realm as well. So I'll give you a little bit more background on the EAPC and how we think it might impact private transfers from parents to children. Um, but we think more broadly, why it's important to tell you is, you know, for one, it, it helps us sort of interpret the impact of the EAPC on other outcomes. Um, so for instance, there's a large literature which I've contributed to that shows positive effects of the EAPC. You know, knowing to what extent is this, you know, I, I don't know, Necessarily, no, we want to call this as an under or an overestimate, but the extent to which this is impacting financial transfers from parents kind of helps us interpret the magnitude of some of those impacts. So, for instance, we have a long literature that uh, finds that the EAP increases labor supply, particularly for single mothers. Um, it reduces poverty and it increases the long term earnings of single mothers. Uh, and it also has a host of positive effects on the children of the EAP recipients. So if the EAPC, for instance, crowds out private transfers um, from parents to children, that you know, suggests that some of the benefits of the EAPC are actually kind of transferred up the, the generational ladder, that parents are kind of saving money from, from, uh, from the EAPC. Um, or it could be you know, a sense that you know, if it's crowding it out, you know, the increase in the EATC isn't leading to that much of an increase on, uh, on the adult child's uh, family income if their parents are compensating uh, with that uh, by reducing the transfers they give them. Um, on the other hand, you can also imagine a story, and I'll talk on the next slide, about you know, the theoretical justification for why we might see crowd in or crowd out. But if the EATC crowds in financial support, um, it suggests that some of these positive effects we found in the broader literature could be in part explained by the fact that you know, parents are essentially supporting that EATC benefit by also providing more transfers to their uh, children. Any questions so far? Okay, so one more slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, how we came into this thinking the different rationales for what we might expect to happen. Um, you know, I think maybe we came into this project expecting some degree of crowd out. So this has been found in other literatures. You know, we would imagine um, uh, that if the EATC is increasing uh, benefits to adult children, perhaps the parents are responding by reducing how much they support their children. You know, from an economic standpoint, uh, this is consistent with an altruistic model uh, of transfers. If parents are behaving altruistically and, and care about uh, their, their children's income, you know, if the EITC is, is providing some of that income, then the parents might pull back it and, um, and reduce the, the transfers they give their children. In a purely altruistic model, we would expect these to kind of be offset one to one, that each dollar of EITC benefits would be offset by a dollar increase in transfers from parents, if we think that, that uh, if, if the parents operate under a purely altruistic model. Um, but there's, you know, I think uh, a lot of skepticism for that model. Um, and there's a reason to think that financial transfers from parents might actually increase. Um, so under like a paternalistic preferences model where parents um, uh, give transfers to their children in support of, we'll say, kind of good behavior or if they're engaging in different activities that the parents support, say, getting more education, buying a house, entering the workforce, you know, the parents uh, tend to like to support the purchase of certain goods, um, advancing uh, the, you know, the preferences that they're, they're in favor of, um, but not other behaviors. Um, and so we might think that if the EITC is inducing adult children into the labor force, for instance, maybe parents are going to help support that positive behavior by providing more transfers to their children. There might be, uh, you know, a more of a practical reason for this as well. There might be some temporary liquidity constraints that these adult children might be facing. So if adult children are entering the labor force, there's maybe an upfront cost they have to incur to uh, enter the workforce, such as fixing a car or finding child care, um, you know, other sort of costs associated with the labor force that maybe the parents are helping support. 
And lastly, we might find no effect. Um, if parents are uh, more motivated, motivated by exchange, there ne doesn't necessarily need to be crowd out. So um, uh, we think this is kind of theoretically ambiguous. So Okay, so as I alluded to, you know, our, our main research question here is, is looking at how an increase in EATC generosity impacts the financial transfers. And here again, we're thinking of parents who we don't think are, we are going to condition on those that are unlike, very unlikely to be EATC eligible themselves, so non-EATC eligible parents to their EATC eligible adult children. Um, we're mostly concerned here with financial transfers, uh, but we are going to explain it, uh, try to uh, explain some of uh, the effects that we find by looking at some, uh, some mechanisms. So we'll be kind of replicating some prior work that um, you know, some of the long literature on the EATC that uh, looks at how the EATC affects employment. So we'll look to see if this is consistent with the idea that adult children are entering the labor force, and so parents might be uh, responding to that behavior. Uh, we're also going to be uh, getting, we can't get totally at in-kind transfers, but um, we can see if there are changes in co-residence um, between the parent and the adult child that might also kind of lend themselves to um, maybe parents uh, uh, exchanging financial transfers or in-kind transfers or, or uh, vice versa. Uh, and then again, we don't have a complete uh, set of time transfers between parents and children that kind of flow down and the generational ladder. But we will be looking at um, if parents are kind of, um, uh, it's, it might be kind of crowding out of financial transfers, but increasing the time they spend, say, caring for grandchildren, or if they're kind of uh, making a decision about which of which of the types of transfers they're they're engaging with their children. Okay, questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll give just a bit of background on the EACC before talking about uh, our um, analysis plan. So for those of you not familiar, the EITC is one of our largest cash transfer programs. In recent years, uh, I think this was the last year, the maximum credit you could get for a family with three children was over $7,000. Um, and among uh, EITC recipients who have children, the average benefit is about $3,000, um, so a pretty sizable uh, credit. Um, it's fully refundable, so that means that if parents, if families don't have any tax liability, they still get the credit as part of the third tax refund. It's targeted specifically at low-income households, but you have to have some earnings to qualify. So everybody, uh, in order to get the credit, has to have worked at some point in the in uh, a calendar year. Um, and this is, like I said, geared towards lower-income households. So this is largely targeting families with income right around 225% of the poverty line. Um, but the maximum benefits accrue to people earning about twenty dollars to uh, $30,000 of earnings. Um, so we're going to be exploiting um, a lot of the variation that's happened in the EATC over the last several decades. So it's been around since the 1970s, but there's been a lot of expansions to the credit, both the federal and the state level, um, that have increased the size of the benefit. I'll show you a picture of this on the next slide. Um, there's also been, uh, you know, this number we have to change almost all the time, but I think that we're at 31 states and D.C. have EATC. Most of these are just a fraction of the federal benefit. So if you are eligible for the federal credit, if you file your state taxes, you can also claim a state EITC. So this generates variation both in the timing and in the generosity of benefits, um, depending on uh, what year it is, what state you live in, and how many kids are in your family. So this is um, uh, a figure that shows the changes in the average EITC benefits. I think this is for a two-child household. Uh, and each line here represents a different state. Um, so the largest uh, expansion to the EITC occurred in the uh, early 1990s. You can see this huge increase in benefits that happened in the early 1990s. But there have also been a number of states that have introduced EITCs over time. So this also generates a, a, a decent degree of variation. So between 1990 and 2015, the average credit grew about $2,200 in real terms. Um, and if you compare the least generous, aka a state that doesn't have an EITC, to a state with the most generous EITC, that difference is about $1,000. So pretty big uh, changes uh, in benefits over this time period. Yeah, so. The states that rolled in and the states that decided not to do it, do they accord with what we would expect in terms of other characteristics of those states? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. So um, so California, for instance, only established an EITC in the late 2018s, like in 2018, 2019. Um, one of the earlier adopting states, you know, some of the earlier adopting states are states like Rhode Island, Wisconsin's had one for a long time, Minnesota's had one for a long time. There are some in the South as well. I should have brought them out, but I don't, I don't have one today. So there's definitely less generous 
state benefits in this in the southeast region of the country, but there are also a number of more conservative states that have their own EATCs, given it pro work um, uh, policy. A lot of states actually use TANF dollars, uh, so cash welfare dollars, to, to fund their state EATCs. So they became much more common after federal welfare reform in the 1990s, and then there were uh, a handful of states before 1996 that had them as well. Um, so it's kind of all over the place. We are going to do an analysis where we look just at the federal variation to kind of reduce some concerns that there's endogeneity of state adoption of, of EATCs, but our, and, and most of our effects are driven by the federal variation because it's the largest one, as you can see. Yeah, very much. Okay, so now on to the data, which probably many of you are already familiar with. So um, as you might expect, doing intergenerational work, there's a couple of candidate data sets we can use, both of which are housed at the University of Michigan. Um, we're going to be using the Health and Retirement Study for this. Um, this is a nationally representative uh, panel study of older cohort, or people over the age of 50. Uh, it's been around since the early 1990s. We're not going to be taking advantage of the panel nature, at least for this part. We're kind of going to be treating it like a, a repeated cross-section. Um, uh, it does have, you know, started with these cohorts uh, for 1931 to 21, and additional cohorts have been added over time uh, to keep the sample essentially representative of people age 50 and older. Okay, so we're going to be mostly using the HRS brand family file. So this is going to uh, have information of parents, the HRS respondents, linked to their adult children. And so we have uh, kind of, uh, variables that are specific uh, for these pairs. So we know things about, for instance, the, thing that, the outcomes that we're interested in here, which are the time and money transfers um, and characteristics of the child. Um, and we also have information about uh, other all the all their adult children that we. Um, we make use of it in, in more in, in some later in some future work um, that I'll talk about at the end. Um, and then, because we're using some of uh, the state variation in EITC, we're getting the respondent and child state of residence from the restricted geographic data, um, and some, we take some variables from the HRS tracker and the RAND longitudinal files. Okay, so the HRS is a really nice data set for this question because we have information on these three generations. So the HRS respondent, who I've been calling the parent generation, we have information on uh, the adult children of those respondents and then the grandchildren of the HRS respondents. Um, so we know about the bi-directional transfers of time and money between the respondent and their children. Um, so in this paper, like I said, we're going to be focusing on the transfers from the HRS respondent, who we're calling the parents, uh, to, their adult, uh, to their adult children. Uh, there are also some challenges here, though, that I will uh, walk through. Um, so everything that I will be presenting here is, is reported by the HRS respondent. And so I'll show you, you know, that, that has some limitations, uh, you know, in, in particular things like the parent reports whether their child is working. So that's a little bit going to be measured with some error. Uh, we don't know how much, uh, but uh, that's, that's a limitation here. Uh, and so we know we know less about the adult children than you know, all of the all of the EATC literature that focuses on the EATC recipients. So we're kind of seeing this from the perspective of parents of potential EATC eligible children, which is kind of interesting, but also limiting in that you know we don't know as much about this generation as we would like. Uh, the big thing, though, that's limiting here is that we don't actually know the ages of all of their grandchildren. So we know, you know, how many adult children they have, um, how old the adult children are, and we know which of the grandchildren belong to which adult child. Um, but we don't actually know how old those children are unless they're born after the response, HRS respondent enters. Um, so we can see the, uh, the um, arrival of new grandchildren. Um, but this is limiting because for to identify whether this generation is likely EATC eligible, we need to know if their kids are under the age of 18 or under the age of 19. Um, and so here we're going to have to make some educated guesses that I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, that's the big thing I wanted to say here. So that's our big limitation here is that we don't know the ages of the grandchildren, and so we're going to have to make some restrictions to try to reduce the likelihood of these kids being uh, too old to qualify as, as children for the purposes of the EITC. So what we're going to do is we're going to restrict, restrict our sample. We're going to call them unmarried daughters. This is the, again, the adult child generation, the unmarried daughters we're going to call them. 
So we're going to restrict our sample to um, unmarried daughters of HRF respondents who are between the ages of 25 to 39 who themselves don't have a four-year college degree. This is kind of these restrictions and who has at least one child. Those are restrictions that are consistent with the broader, if I were just, inter, if I were just surveying those, that generation, that's, those are the types of restrictions um, typically made in this literature. And, and the idea here is to try to identify a population that's pretty likely eligible for the EHC. So something like two-thirds of single moms uh, are eligible for the EHC. So we're restricted. We're not looking at um, uh, married children here because they're unlikely to be or less likely to be eligible for the EATC. We're also making these age restrictions um, because of the limitations of the data. So we're restricting uh, our sample to uh, unmarried daughters who are at least 25 because if you're younger than 25, uh, using the PSID, we've shot, we've um, shown that you are less you, people under the age of 25 are, are unlikely to have a parent over the age of 50, at least during this time frame. So by age 25, the majority of people have a parent over the age of 50, and that's the minimum age that we would observe their parents in the HRS. So this is kind of a we're observe we're uh, the sampling frame is the HRS respondents who are 50 and older, so their children are likely to be 25 and older. So we make that minimum age restriction there. We make the 39 age restriction, which is making me feel very old, because people over the age of 40 are more likely to have a kid that's 18 or older. So, um, and we again did some analysis in the PSID to look and in the CPS to look at what share of 40-year-olds have people have children over the age of 18, and it was big enough that we felt like there was too much measurement error in figuring out how many of their children would qualify them for the EITC. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of a complicated thing. But essentially, people 40 and older are much more likely to have a kid that's too old to qualify them for the EATC. Uh, and so we're making these age restrictions in order to be consistent with um, kind of getting a naturally representative sample that would have parents over the age of 50 and not have kids over the age of 19. Okay, uh, I think I covered most of that. Um, we explicitly make some uh, sample restrictions for the HRS respondents, which are, are not, they're not, it doesn't uh, take uh, a lot of our sample, but we wanna make sure that the parent generation themselves are not eligible for the EATC. So we drop page, uh, HRS respondents um, who have any dependent children under the age of 19, or if they're under 24 and attending school, that also qualifies them for the EATC. So we just drop all HRS respondents who have any children that meet those uh, criteria. So if they have you know, an unmarried daughter that meets that criteria, we still um, cut them from our sample. So that leaves us with 13,686 sort of parent adult child dyads. So some of these HRS respondents are represented more than once. I think something like 20% of our HRS respondents have two unmarried daughters who meet these criteria. Um, uh, so so these are um, not, not unique HRS respondents, but parent child dyads. Yes? Is this um, HRS respondents like a panel design where they are observed? No, we're not treating it like a panel. So we're just looking at them like each year of the HRS, are they, uh, do they meet these criteria? So it could be the case that an HRS respondent might not, might be kicked out of our sample like in 1992 because their child is too young, but they might be eligible to be in our sample in 1996 because their child has aged. Uh, is that your question essentially? Yeah, so, so we're making this restriction in a survey year base, on a survey year basis, yeah. Do you lose a lot of respondents due to the eligible children? We don't lose a lot. I don't know the number off the top of my head. I think, yeah, I know we, our paper's not available anywhere. I was going to say, in the paper, I know we do. A, we show a table that shows how all HR respondents compare to these sample restrictions. I mean, this is a more disadvantaged population in general compared to all HRS respondents because of the unmarried daughter restriction. But the restriction about dropping them because they have a dependent child is it's a, I want to say it's 10% or less of our cases. It's not a huge, this one is not uh, limiting us a lot. Okay, so um, jumping into our, our appeal for strategy. So we're going to be using the strategy that um, uh, is fairly well established in the CRTC literature. So using this parameterized difference and differences, we're essentially going to simulate the value of the, the changes in the EITC over time. So we're going to be using the CPS to do this. Essentially, we take a sample uh, of single mothers from the CPS, and we run them through TAXIM, um, uh, NBR's TAXIM, to simulate their EITC eligibility um, based on the year, state, number of children. And so here, we're going to get um, uh, a sample uh, that is going to reflect the average EITC benefits, both federal and state benefits, 
um, for single mothers um, uh, every year, uh, each state and, and uh, for each family size. And then we'll merge that back onto our HRS sample. So for each HRS respondent child dyad, we'll have a measure for what's the average EITC benefit that family could expect to receive, given what year they, it is, what state they live in, and how many kids they have. So this identification is going to come from uh, changes to the size of the benefit that have happened over time at the federal and the state level, and it also vary by family size. Essentially, that figure I was showing you before, that's going to be a lot of where our variation is coming from. Um, so our model, uh, we're going to have our outcomes of interest. We're going to model that as a function of this simulated credit, which we're going to put in $500 increments, because that's about the average um, uh, uh, change uh, in the ITC benefits in our sample. We have a number of adult child demographic characteristics, like their age and educational attainment. We control for a number of other state year contextual factors that might be correlated with uh, state EITC generosity and also the outcomes of interest, like the state unemployment rates, um, maximum TANF benefits, um, the minimum wage. Uh, in some models, we have a state linear time trend. We also have state near fixed effects. And number of this is the number of sort of these, and they're, they're consistent with my terminology, the grandchildren. So the number of children of the adult child generation. Um, and so we're going to be interested in this beta one coefficient, which is just going to tell us the um, average, the effect of a five hundred dollar increase in the ATC generosity on the outcome of interest. And in terms of our outcomes, um, we're going to primarily, you know, our motivation was to look at financial transfers. Um, so in the HRS, we know there's a there's kind of a question that asks whether you give your child five hundred dollars or more in the past two years. We did not come up with this five hundred dollars. That's what what the question is. Um, so we don't have a perfect extensive margin like do you give your kids any benefits or any any money? But five hundred dollars. I think it's fairly minimal over two years. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's not a huge amount of money. Um, uh, and then we also know the amount uh, the, that they give their children if they give their children anything. So we're going to be looking both at the extensive, the extensive margin of whether they give any, um, but any uh, money to their children and then how much they give to their children. To explore some of these mechanisms that I talked about at the beginning, we're going to be, and these are all we're going to measure for the um, adult child. Um, so we're going to be looking at whether the adult child is employed. Again, thinking through, thinking that um, one of the mechanisms through which um, parents might change their um, financial transfers is if their children are entering the labor market to get the EITC, if that's impacting uh, parents' decisions about financial transfers. Uh, we don't have great measures of employment, so we know whether they're employed. We know if they're working at least 30 hours a week. Um, and then we also, we don't have a continuous measure of income, but there is a categorical income variable and there's a, a flag for kind of low income, which the threshold also changes over time, but it's roughly around $30,000, $35,000. So we create an indicator for whether the adult child is of low income uh, using that threshold. Uh, and that's because we might think, and some work Natasha and I have done have shown that the EATC impacts uh, co-resident decisions. Um, we're going to be able to observe whether the adult child is living co-residing with their parent um, and whether they live within 10 miles of the parent. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to look at whether uh, the HRS respondent is providing any grandchild to that to the grandchildren of that adult uh, to the children of that adult child. Okay, so showing some descriptives. Um, so first I'm showing some, uh, this, these are characteristics of the adult child. And so these are from our HRS sample. Um, just for comparison, I'm putting uh, in some uh, characteristics based on the CPS over the same time frame, making the same um, limitation. So single mothers with no more than some college who have at least one child of, uh, in the CPS, I can restrict it to people and have those who have a, a child under the age of 18 um, and who are between 25 and 39 years old. Um, you know, we do pretty good, I think, on age and birth year. There are some, and I think this is largely where the limitation of having the HRS respondent report characteristics comes in. Um, a couple places where this comes out, we have similar levels reporting that they don't have a high school degree. But we do see actually higher rates of some college in the CPS compared to the HRS, which we are thinking this might be because parents might be less likely to know if their child you know, took a couple courses at a community college. They might not consider, you know, what they consider some college might be different if you're self-reporting this whether, um, as opposed to whether the parent's reporting it. We don't have a way of verifying that, but that's at least our hypothesis. Um, also consistent with that is that, um, that in the HRS, we see higher rates of the parents reporting. The parents are reporting higher rates of employment for their adult children than they are in the CPS. Again, we're thinking this might be, you know, wishful thinking, or maybe the adult children are not being totally um, honest with their parents. We're not quite sure, but that, that, that is what it is. Um, 
uh, and the shares that are reporting low, a little bit less than the CPS. Um, and terms of things we can observe specifically in the, in the HRS, about half are living within 10 miles of their parent. Um, we do reassuringly see fairly similar rates that are living with their parents, so 14% in the HRS and it's 17% in the CPS. Um, so those all look fairly consistent um, with those similar limitations there too. Um, maybe I'm going to skip the, the, this is characteristics of the parent, nothing really, I think, to point out too much there. Um, I think, uh, oh yeah, 28% uh, of their uh, respondents have uh, at least two um, adult children who meet our criteria, so that's the overlap. Um, okay, so in terms of our transfer outcomes, so about 23% um, of our adult children receive any financial transfers from their parent, so the HR respondent giving the adult child. Um, unconditional on receipt, the average amount is about $864 over a two-year period. Conditioning on receipt, the average amount is about $4,000. Um, and about 26% uh, re receive some kind of grandchild care from, from the HRS respondent, which is about a quarter. Okay, so jumping into our results. Um, so I'm going to be showing outcomes for whether they, this is kind of the extensive margin, if they receive any financial transfers and any amount received. Um, so in the first column there, uh, that's uh, showing the impact of a, th a $500 increase in average EATC benefits on the likelihood that the HRS respondent uh, or the adult child receives at least $500 from their parent. Um, it's increasing by about one percentage point. It's not statistically significant, um, but on the, the base of our dependent variable, about 22%, you know, it's about a 5% increase if we want to take that point, uh, point estimate at face value. Um, we see an increase in the amount received, so increases by about $190. Conditioning on those who receive, which we don't feel terrible about doing since it doesn't look like there's an extensive margin response, uh, there's about a seven, almost a $700 increase in um, financial transfers from parents. So this, was, this went against what we were expecting kind of coming in, so this is suggested that um, actually parents are giving more money to their children as a function of EHC generosity, so this is evidence of crowd in rather than crowd out. Um, so that was just the direction was a little bit surprising to us, but um, that's what we, that's, those are the results. Um, you know, unpacking this a little bit, we split the sample um, by whether the parents, the HRS respondents are low income or not, because we would imagine that higher income parents might be more in a position to give transfers to their children. And that certainly seems to be the case. Now you might be asking yourself, how many low-income adult children have non-low-income parents? It's actually almost 40% of our sample where the parent generation is not considered low-income, but they have some low-income children, or you know, they have unmarried daughters, so it's not a totally a rare thing. Um, when we look, if we let's put the sample by this, uh, whether or not the parents are low-income, it looks like these trans, these increase in transfers are largely coming from the non-low-income parents. So we see a larger increase in the amount. Um, they uh, give to their children, um, both unconditionally and conditional on, on giving any money. Um, for the low-income parents, we don't see, it's really mostly a null effect. So we actually see a pretty close to zero impact on whether or not they give any benefits, to, uh, any transfers to their children, and uh, really no impact on the amount that they give their children. Um, you know, I think this in itself is uh, also suggested that there's not really evidence of crowd out even among these low income, <laughs> these families that were, the parents are low income as well. So these coefficients, you know, aside from this one is pretty close to zero, are still positive. So, Overall, we don't find really evidence that the EACC is crowding out transfers that parents give their children. Um, we also know that uh, parents tend to give more money to their younger children, and we don't have a lot of precision here, but at least we find some suggestive evidence that, that's, that the transfers are larger for the younger children. So for 25 to 29 year olds, at least the point estimates are much larger um, than they are for the older children, um, but we don't have a lot of precision here, so I don't want to make too much of that, but at least it's suggestive that they're giving more money to their younger children, which is consistent with what we know about just descriptively or demographically um, the uh, transfer between parents and adult children. Okay, moving into uh, mechanisms. Uh, so first I'm gonna look at employment. Again, this is employment of the adult child. We actually did look at employment of the HRS respondent and we didn't really find anything, so we haven't, we didn't really see a reason to, to put that in here. Um, <clears throat> We don't, so that we don't find a, a significant increase in uh, the extensive margin of employment. Um, there is a positive coefficient for working full time, uh, and we do find evidence that the EATC reduces the likelihood that the adult children are reported as low income. So it does suggest that um, the income of the adult children is increasing, this is absent the financial transfers. So we think this, this 
um, in itself is evidence against a purely altruistic model. So it does look like their income is rising and parents are still transferring more money to their children. So this doesn't seem to be consistent with an altruistic model of, uh, of financial transfers. Um, we are, we're hoping to find some significant positive effects on employment, I have to be honest, um, because that is what the literature shows. So we do reproduce estimates from the CPS that show that there is, in fact, a positive employment response. We don't, you know, we don't really find anything in the HRS. This could be because of the mis, you know, potentially more <laughs> um, But you know, we would have liked these numbers to at least be more positive than that. But I'll show you some robustness checks where we do see a little bit more evidence uh, suggesting that they're working more. Okay. So, oh, did, was there a hand up? No. Okay. Uh, so turning to our results, um, so in the top um, panel here, I'm showing results for these co-resident um, outcomes. So we look to see whether children, there's evidence that these adults are maybe moving out of the house, and that might be explaining some of these financial transfers. We Again, we don't have a lot of precision here, but we can see a two percentage point decline in the likelihood of living within 10 miles of the parent. Um, not a huge uh, effect on co-residents. Again, these are um, kind of noisy. Um, but we do see, you know, if we think that parents are giving more financial transfer, you might expect maybe they're pulling back on um, time transfers they're spending um, for their for their children. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And, and Natasha, again, and I have done some work on this, showing that grandparents do seem to be um, uh, providing some grandchild care um, uh, as a function of the EAGC. And we certainly find evidence of that here. So this is telling us that um, as the EAGC becomes more generous, uh, those interest respondents are about seven and a half percentage points more likely to be giving some kind of grandchild care to those grandchildren of the adult children uh, of the EACC eligible generation. So, um, so that kind of tells us, you know, it's not, these parents basically seem to be, um, in response to the EHEC, both helping their children more with grandchild care and helping their children more with finances, uh, with, with finances by giving them more um, transfers. Um, so certainly not consistent with an altruistic model of transfers. Okay, so some robustness checks. Um, you know, this large expansion in the EATC that I talked about, um, the federal expansion, that happened right, right before welfare reform. And so, you know, one big criticism of this literature is, you know, can we really disentangle the effect of the EATC from the effect of TANF? And, you know, my take on this is it's just really hard to do because those things happen at the same time. So, you know, I think there's things that we can do, and we're going to try to do them here to try to um, rule out that this is driven by TANF and not by the EATC. Um, so we do have some additional TANF controls in one of our models. So we um, control for state welfare waivers. This, I think, has become more of a conventional thing to do in the EHEC literature um, to try to rule out that uh, these are, results are driven by uh, TANF and not the EHEC. And we're also going to control for the share of the population that's receiving TANF to get a marker for you know, how, how big of a program TANF is in that state. Um, and there's also, you know, I think um, more concerns in recent years about the, using uh, the staggered implementation of state EITCs. I have been able to justify this a lot uh, in, in, until very recently because we're using a continuous measure of, of benefits, which up until I think like a month or so ago, there has not been incorporated in the new diff and diff literature that uh -huh. has been just thinking of binary. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just wait for that to happen. <laughs> but I did see there was a paper that came out recently that's uh, uh, trying to deal with continuous variables in a staggered implementation. So we have not brought that in yet, so we need to update our reading list there and, and figure out what we're going to do. But instead, what we do is we focus specifically on the federal expansions in the 1990s to see, you know, in that context where we're not relying on the state variation, do we still see the same uh, type of thing? Okay, so um, this is uh, showing results from different specifications. So this is our main specification. Again, we find about a $200 increase in transfers associated with a $500 increase in the EATC. Um, uh, and so those are all of our outcomes kind of put in one uh, column there. Um, if we add tandem controls, that really doesn't change our models, at, uh, our estimates at all. So we don't think those are really driving our effects. If we just rely on the federal variation, the results are again fairly similar. In this model, we just we use only the federal variation. We only look at the 1990s. So this is, I think, the context where staggered implementation is, is kind of a uh, you know least concerning. Um, and then this last model, we add those TANF controls as well. They don't seem to matter. Um, so this is you know 1990s adding extra TANF controls. Um, in some ways, this kind of produces the effects that we would have liked to see in our main specification. Um, but we uh, we did not go in you know, with that model in mind. So we haven't been using it as our main model. Um, but let me just walk through um, why we like these results. So first of all, we see a significant increase in employment now. So now we see that 
as the EITC becomes more generous, the adult children are more likely to work by about five percentage points. What's interesting is that you'll see a lot, a lot of things that are, are about five percentage points. So they're five percentage points more likely to work. They appear to be five percentage points less likely to live with their parents, which could be those same people kind of entering the labor market and you know gaining financial independence, sort of financial independence from their parents, so moving out. They're also about five percentage points more likely to be getting grandchild care from their uh, from their parents. And they're four percentage points more likely to be getting uh, some kind of financial transfer from their parents. So if these are the same people that would suggest that about 80% of the people who used to work are, are newly getting some financial transfers from their parents, if we want to um, take those as the same folks. Um, and they're getting about $400 more from their parents or conditional on. I, I, here I, I would caution against kind of using the conditional on receipt given the changes on the extensive margin, but it looks about like a $400 increase um, in financial transfers from their parents. Questions about that? I threw a lot at you. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that when you're using the state standard variation, it, it, the, time, the variation range between like longer time period. So does that mean that when you're using their variation in like 90s, it's like look at the subsample of yes. the specific? Yeah, we're looking at the subsample. So we're only using the data in the 1990s. And the, the HRS survey, yeah, the survey's from the 1990s. So we're ignoring everything 2000 and onward. How small is that relative? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. I don't have the sample sizes in front of me. Um, I don't. I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's. It's. Yeah. I couldn't. I, I don't even want to speculate because I don't have the sample sizes off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, so for the 1990s only models, the federal EITC would dump like in the like 92, 95. So this is mostly comparing like early to late 90s. Yeah. Are you like? Early 90s, there was the recession. Late 90s were a pretty good labor market. How are you kind of accounting for those? economic differences. Yeah, I mean, so we have, I mean, we still have year fixed effects in here that would be, you know, accounting for federal, you know, like national trends uh, at the year level. We are controlling for state level things like the unemployment rate at the, at the state level. The, um, and I think in these models, we also have state linear time trends. So we would be capturing kind of trends in these outcomes. Um, so that's, I think, that's what we're doing right now. If you have other things in mind, we're happy to try other things out. But yeah, that's, uh, but I think to keep in mind also, this is we're, when we're looking at that 90s model, that 1990s model, what we're really doing there is comparing the families that have more, like larger, more children to those with fewer children, which you certainly could tell stories where, you know, a better labor market might differentially affect families with more children versus fewer children. Um, but here we are, we are leveraging more of that variation that's by family size here. Okay, let me, I got just a few more slides and then I'm happy to take more questions. Um, so, you know, just to um, summarize those results, we find that our results are largely robust, including these more uh, stringent tandem controls, and they actually seem stronger when we limit our variation to the federal variation in the 1990s, where, you know, we see more clear evidence of an employment effect, more clear evidence that children are moving out of their parents' home, potentially exchanging in-kind housing support with financial support. So maybe parents are so happy to get their kids out of the house that they're, you know, willing to help their child kind of transition to a more independent uh, living situation. Okay, uh, so I think uh, just a couple more, uh, just to kind of wrap up, we don't find any evidence of crowd out of financial transfers from parents to children. Um, we actually see the opposite. We see that these private uh, financial transfers actually increase in the response to increased EITC generosity. And these impacts are pretty big. So a $500 increase in EITC generosity is increasing financial transfers among those who were already receiving transfers by about $700. Um, we find some suggestive evidence of uh, substitution for in-kind transfer, where we see the children moving out of their parents' home. So that might be uh, kind of uh, parents, again, uh, increasing financial transfers to, to compensate for this uh, kind of reduction in in-kind transfers. But that's only in one of our models. Um, but we don't see any evidence that parents are substituting financial transfers for time transfers. They seem to be kind of going all in on helping their children here by also supporting uh, their grandchildren. Um, in terms of uh, how we explain these findings, you know, we don't have we don't have concrete evidence in this, but you know, I think um, you know, this, our, our results are certainly consistent with a story where adult children are entering the labor market because of the EITC. They're facing some temporary liquidity constraints. Um, 
in that process of entering the labor market, such as fixing a car, or buying a used car, or putting down a deposit for daycare um, that the parents are uh, uh, supporting, essentially. So we think this is certainly consistent with a paternalistic preferences model, where parents are supporting um, the, the types of purchases that are signaled or uh, coupled with um, their child kind of gaining more independence from them. Um, and we think our findings are just generally consistent with the broader literature on parental support during the transition to adulthood, where parents are, are um, you know, providing lots of uh, uh, financial support for their children. And of course, there are some limitations here that I've talked about throughout. We do think that the HRS is our best um, candidate for answering this question, um, but we are certainly limited here. So the parents are reporting the child's labor supply and their income, so those things might be misreported. Uh, we don't have information on the consumption of adult children, so we can't actually see whether they're buying a new car or um, spending more on, on childcare. Um, and of course, we had to make these sample restrictions to uh, to try to get it, to, you know, to rule out some of these limitations of uh, not having uh, a representative sample for kids under 25, or yeah, kids under 25. Um, and let's say I alluded to this uh, at the beginning, um, we are working on kind of a companion piece that looks at the upward transfers. These are more, a little bit more focused on care work that, uh, you know, care help that um, adult children are providing their parents. Um, so that's, again, something we decided to split into its own paper because it, again, was more focused on care and not as much on finances. So we thought it kind of had a whole separate motivation. Um, uh, and we're also in the process of, of, of trying to leverage what we know about the adult siblings in the HRS. We've done this certainly uh, in this other work on the upward transfers to see if um, uh, the other adult siblings are kind of being impacted and, and what the potential spillover effects are for them. Um, so I will stop there and I'm happy to take questions. I think we have a few minutes left. So, but thank you very much. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'd be here, curious to hear you speculate um, if you think these results are sensitive to your choice of focusing on single women who are mothers rather than all parents who might be eligible for the EITC, because I could imagine that um, you know married men more so, but also potentially married women, um, the EITC might not result in kind of the same transfers of parents helping out with the kids or giving money for daycare when there's another parent at home who could assist with those tasks if one parent is returning to work. Yeah, it's a really good question, um, and you know, just to be upfront, you know, I think the married the married EITC eligible population was just largely overlooked in, in the larger literature on the EITC for lots of reasons. Um, I think that there's it would certainly be interesting to look at that at, um, at that population. I think you're right. I think we wouldn't we wouldn't expect to see the same things for lots of different reasons, um, in part because the literature on the on married. Um, married EITC eligible parents suggest that actually mothers kind of drop out of the labor force. And so that if mothers are dropping out of the labor force in response to the EITC, then we certainly wouldn't expect to see grandchild care, for instance, from the grandparents. Um, but the financial transfers is an open question. I'm not sure. Um, I think that would be interesting. I think, yeah, we certainly could, could, could take a look at it. I think the other problem is that it's hard, like, a smaller fraction of married couples are eligible for the EITC, so finding ways to kind of identify that population um, is a little bit harder to do, but I think there's certain, it's certainly worth kind of digging more into that population. Thanks. Um, I have a question about the difference between your um, CPS sample and the HRS sample, mm -hmm. and do you know if the women that you look at in the CPS to create the benefits have living parents? No, we don't. Uh, yeah, so that's the other limitation. I didn't bring that up, but um, we also see some like uh, the the racial makeup of our sample is different than the CPS, and we think this is in part by um, driven by differences in ha the likelihood of, of having a living parent, and also having a living parent who lives in the U.S. So, for instance, like our Hispanic population is smaller in the HRS. We think largely because the adult children might be less likely to have a parent over the age of 50 who's in the US um, compared to other demographic groups. Um, and the living parent is certainly, I think, going to be more of a limitation, for instance, for, for the black population, too. So it, I think our sample is certainly, it skews a little bit more white than the general population in the CPS. So those are, we can't totally identify why that's the case. I don't know if the PSID might be able to help us get a sense of that, at least for the living parents. I'm not sure. Do we know if the, I don't know if we know, in the, I guess, the, the PSID wouldn't be great for the his, like trying to get at immigration stuff, but certainly for a living parent, we could get a, a better sense of that. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, help. Uh, I, I was a little um, surprised that like the signs on like 
living with your grandparent and like providing grandparent childcare kind of like went opposite directions. I would think that if you're just living with your kid, you're gonna like just provide grand grand care. And I was wondering like what you were thinking about that, or maybe it's just like a reporting thing where if I live with my kid, I just don't even think about like providing grand uh, grand care because yeah. yeah. I'm just doing it. Yeah, that's kind of what we were thinking. And I think actually the question the HRS I think asks if you've given at least 100 hours of grandchild care. So we also, I don't know what, people who know the HRS, I don't know why we don't have extensive margin that are truly like, do you give any? But yeah, so I think the threshold is 100 hours. And we were just speculating that the people who live with their grandchildren, of course, like all of them are going to meet that. And so they're not really on the margin of changing their behavior, that it, it's probably driven more from the, the a trust response who are not co-residing with the grandchildren. Um, but yeah, I think we could, we could probably look at that a little bit more explicitly to see like if that's driven entirely by the non-co-resident grandparent, which I'm guessing it is. <coughs> I guess it's also, that, now I'm like talking about this, I, I guess it's also theoretically <laughs> possible that caring for your grandchild might be more salient to you if your kid moves out of the house. Like, so it's possible that that's like just a reporting difference that the kids are moving out and you're saying you're giving more grandchild care, but maybe you're not. Maybe you just think you are because you're actually going to sell your child's house and get. So that's possible. Um, I would be surprised if that was all of our effect, but that certainly could be part of it if we think the grandparents are just reporting, providing that care more because it's more salient to them or something. I got a little turned around in the various sample restrictions of. Yeah. So the parents are over 50, yeah. the kid has to be over 25, yeah. but less than 40. And I was just yeah. wondering, like, and then the grandparents also have to not have minor children. Like, what overall fraction do we lose? And what is the remainder of the sample like? Like, are they disproportionately? Yeah, I don't think I have that one. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, let's let's see. See. I, their kids had kids young. I, yeah, I lost it. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't think I have it with me. We have it in our paper, which I'd be happy to send to you if you want. Um, we do have a table in our paper where we show like the overall HRS um, sample compared to like what we end up with. My overall, they're certainly more disadvantaged. Um, it, it's not, I, and I can't remember what fraction of, of the population they represent of the original HRS um, respondents, but overall, they just seem a little bit more disadvantaged. Um, than the general HRS population, which we think is consistent with conditioning on some of these things that are correlated with income, essentially. Yeah. Um, just a PSID wouldn't be able to help with the income yeah. aspects of your yeah. um, study mm -hmm. because um, don't release the individual income of the children that are, the parents are reporting about um, if they're living in the house. Um, but there is um, information about parents um, of immigrants if they're living in America, in America or where they're living, where they go. Oh, okay. That kind of information. Yeah, we've, we've often thought about bringing in a PSID and, and maybe we will, be, we will end up doing that. Uh, I guess we originally didn't consider it because we were interested in these care aspects um, too. And it turns out when we split the paper into two papers, there's not a whole lot of care happening in this paper. So there's, we in theory could bring in the PSID, I think for most of the questions we're trying to answer here. And that might help give, give us a little bit more precision. So yeah, thanks for but that. There's the um, two uh, time and money transfer um, supplements that the PSID yeah. has. But um, it wouldn't be no, nowhere near the number of sample that you have because um, we would have to have the to get the entirety of what the information you're asking, you'd have to have a parent and a child be the respondent oh, to get okay. the, full, okay. the full information. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's helpful. Yeah. So we'll have to think about yeah whether it's worth kind of diving into that and what that sample size looks like. Thanks. I know I'm over, so I don't want to. Oh yeah. Go ahead, sir. So tell me how how COVID affected all of this, or how you think about other you know big shocks to the system. Are there things that could come down the pike that would change or interrupt? you're thinking about this at all? Or do you think that this policy is gonna be pretty solidly acting in this way? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's, it's really hard to know, I think. I, I think, you know, one, one thing with COVID, that, at least in the beginning, is that a lot of people got laid off. And so, you know, I, I, I haven't seen any kind of work done on this, Maybe there's some preliminary uh, work done to, to show essentially how much of this population lost their entirely lost their EATC eligibility. The one thing, you know, they, there was that change though. It, 
I think it was just, I don't know how many tax years this was uh, implemented, but you could use your prior year income. Like, so in 2020, you could have used your 2019 earnings to claim the EITC. Um, and so that would buffer against some of this, maybe it, this concern that you might entirely lose your EITC benefits because you lost your job. Um, but uh, in general, I think it is still like in the early stages that we don't know a ton about um, the impact of COVID on, on these populations. So. Um, at this point, four years out, we probably can start um, start thinking about that a little bit more explicitly. So, but yeah, it's a good question. And then one other question about, so what do people have to know and understand about their eligibility to make sure that they get this, this credit? So, for example, you, you noted that, like, oh, you could use last year. So if a tax preparer was doing things, they would just be like, oh, you can use your last. But to what extent is there any um, in uptake error because people aren't informed about what? Yeah, so, I mean, more broadly speaking, EITC take-up is around 80%. Especially for people with kids, it tends to be even a little higher than that. Um, so it is a well-known policy that has pretty high take-up rates. And the majority of people who are uh, in this population are also using some kind of paid preparer to do their taxes. So they're either going to a place like H&R Block or one of those other types of um, uh, in-person paid preparers, or they're using something like TurboTax, where TurboTax would certainly walk you through those things. It's, it is very rare, and probably the people in this room are probably a, can attest to that too, it's, it's quite rare to see people kind of hand fi fill, filling out their tax forms these days. Um, so I think the issue would be in not filing your tax, like most of it's coming from people who don't or have their income is too low to file their taxes. That's where you see take-up rates are much lower. The other place actually you see take-up rates that are lower is at the state level. So some people, yeah. believe it or not, will file their, I mean, this I think makes perfect sense if you've all done your taxes on a place like TurboTax, where you have to pay extra to file the state return. Um, so there has been some work showing that some people are missing out on their state, like take up of state EITCs is lower because explicitly because people are filing their federal and likely not paying the extra amount to, to file the state. And that's again, gonna be most of this population that's income is too low for them to be required to file. So for this population, your income is, if your earnings below today, it's, if your earnings are below like $18,000, they don't require to file. So it's a pretty big chunk of Yeah, it's a great question. All right, I think we have reached our uh, ending point. And if you'd like to speak with our speaker for a couple minutes, you are welcome to come join at the front of the room. Uh, but thank you all for the uh, wonderful questions and reception. And thank you most of all uh, for our wonderful speaker. Thanks, everybody. Oh, thank yes.